Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jonathan Stevens with Audio Advice. Thank you so much for joining us for our live stream announcement of our giveaway for the month of March. We are incredibly excited to have several of our really good friends, uh, Nick Brown and Larry Magoo from SDS. Please welcome them. Uh, we are excited to announce our great giveaway and uh, we'll show that here in just a second. Let us know where you're dialing in from. We're excited to have folks not only from North Carolina, from the entire country and even around the world. So it's exciting to see where everyone is joining us from. Uh, if you have a question, I will get to that in just a minute, but be sure to start putting those questions in the comments. If you're joining us on Facebook, on uh, YouTube, we can see those all in one place. So we'll answer as many questions as you can. I see someone from Kalamazoo. I uh, was grew up in Kalamazoo and I was looking for my Bell's Oberon, but I, I'm out of it for a weekend. So <laughs> I'll restock. Uh, so first question, just for fun, just to kick it off. I'll start with, uh, with you, Nick Brown uh, from SBS. What, tell us, your, uh, what is the first concert that you want to go see post COVID? So I know we're not, hopefully not too far away from that. We've actually got, I've got two kids, uh, nine and 12, and we don't, we don't have tickets to a concert, but we have tickets to go see. If you have kids that age, you probably heard of dirt of dude perfect. So we've got tickets to go see those guys in June. So we hope it works out, but first concert post COVID tell us what you're looking forward to go see. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jonathan. First of all, I uh, never miss a happy hour. So we, we love to uh, to be on here and uh, talk shop with you. And uh, yes, salute. Um, Let us know my, uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought up kids because uh, I my next concert will likely be with my 16 year old. He's a big Sublime fan. There's a, a cover band called Bad Fish, which is actually based in uh, or they're from Rhode Island, which is where I'm from. So that's probably going to be our first concert. But I'm really looking forward to seeing Tool. Uh, we usually do a, a, a group uh SVS trip to see a, a concert. We've done Tool before, put on an awesome show. So hopefully they're going to be on the road. And that's my personal favorite. But Bad Fish is probably going to be the uh, concert that I, I get to see next year locally. Oh, yeah, I love love Sublime back in the early mid 90s or so, right? Or even before that. So, all right, uh, Larry, coming to you next. Same question. First concert. Tell us what you're, what you're drinking, I guess. And then, uh, and then what concert you want to go see post COVID when the world's hopefully back into somewhat of normal? Yeah, well, I, I think most of the people up there are familiar watching us. I don't drink much, so I've got a cherry Coke, which I partake in every now and then from uh, Sonic. Um, that's the guy with all those uh, bottles in the background. Yeah, so that, that that's from a special night we had as a company bonding uh, night a few weeks back where we uh, got to do some whiskey tasting and stuff. So uh, those have been hanging out with me and getting sipped on a little bit every now and then. Uh, as far as concerts go, same boat. I got three boys, so we're, you know we want to go find something to do and – I think uh, actually going to a Mavericks basketball game is really high on the list. But yeah. for a concert, uh, my wife and I have been together. All It'll be uh, 20 years this year. And uh, we came together over music from a band called Flicker Stick. And uh, their lead singer has been doing some stuff independently. So we're going to try to go see him uh, once things start opening up. Awesome, awesome. Well, it's great to see uh, where everyone is, is joining us from all over the country. Again, thanks, everyone, for joining uh, like I said, put those comments in the in the in sorry, put those questions in the comments. I'm going to show you exactly what we're going to be giving away uh, on behalf of SBS for best question. So, for best question, we're going to give away a pair of SBS Prime Wireless speaker system, six hundred dollar value for best question. So, like I said, go ahead and, and uh, start loading those comments in the questions and the questions in the comments. We'll get to many of those as we can here in just a minute. Um, why don't we also now kick off? And you guys can tell us. Well, I guess tell us a little bit sort of high level for those who uh, maybe aren't familiar with SBS and, and have been following audio advice for a while. We, we partnered together a little over a year ago now, and um, it's been really exciting. It's been a great partnership. Obviously, launching a new partner during the middle of COVID has been a challenge, uh, but I think it's gone really, really well. Maybe just give us a little bit of the backstory about SBS. Yeah, absolutely. Uh SVS was founded about 20 years ago. Uh, we started making these big cylinder subwoofers in a garage in Youngstown, Ohio. We are still headquartered in Youngstown, Ohio. Now we're actually one of the fastest growing businesses in that area. So that's pretty cool. Um, and, you know, from that point, we uh, evolved to have uh, multiple speaker lines. We have now uh, our SoundPath accessories line. We have uh, a lot more subwoofers than just the big subwoofers, uh, sorry, big cylinder models. We have sealed cabinet models, ported box models. And, uh, you know, really what we're trying to do is just bring uh, world-class immersive audio experiences to more people than ever before. And, you know, we started as Internet Direct, but we've got an, an awesome group of partners now, audio advice included. Um, you know, I echo your feelings about it being a challenging time to kick things off. But, uh, you know, it's been great to, to be with you. I know you guys have some some great showrooms that you have set up. So, uh, you know, you can hear SVS right there in person. But, um, 
yeah, I mean, we're just uh, we're just trying to get more people interested into this hobby. That's really what SVS is all about is, uh, you know, bringing the passion, the fun, the uh, expertise back to this, which uh, really aligns great with what all your advice is doing. Um, and we've gotten some recent product launches. We've, we've had some fun over the past few months. So hopefully we'll get to talk about that. Um, but yeah, that's sort of uh, it in a nutshell for now. And uh, we're just looking to do big things and, and keep growing. Yeah, that's great. For those of you, we have two showrooms in Raleigh and Charlotte, North Carolina. We have a full SDS room uh, in Raleigh and we have a great setup in Charlotte as well. And SDS is known for a lot of their big in-person events. And so we haven't been able to do that over the last year, obviously with, with COVID. That's something that we're really, really excited about. So if you're ever in one of those two areas, please come by and see us. If you're on the way to the beach, on the way to the mountains, stop by either one of our showrooms. Uh, we'd love to give you a killer demo. We'll get into some great uh, demo recommendations. I know both Larry and Nick have a couple of great lists that they're going to share uh, as well. So let's talk about a little bit. One of you guys kind of run through exactly what it is. The, uh, the package that we're gonna be giving away here today, I will throw it up on the screen and uh, hand it over to you guys to kind of walk us through this incredible giveaway. Larry, I'm gonna let you do the honors with this one if you don't mind. Yeah, so we, we've got a really awesome 5.1 system that's gonna be given away. Uh, I'll start with the speakers and then round it out with the sub. We're gonna give away a pair of prime bookshelf speakers I, along with a matching three-way prime center channel. So that'll be your front stage. And then the rears are a pair of our prime satellites, which I really hate referring to as satellites because uh, they're really a nine pound small bookshelf. So it's a great setup for your five speaker surround. And then you're going to be able to finish it off with either one of our brand new SB1000 Pros or the PB1000 Pro. So the sealed or ported model, both of which are 12 inch, 325 watt subwoofers. So you'll have a phenomenal 5.1 surround experience, no matter what room you're throwing it in. So you've got a great package there that somebody's going to end up in their living room or bedroom or game room or wherever and uh, really rock out. Yeah, absolutely. That's a killer package, you know, $23, $2,400 value almost when, it, when you choose which, which subwoofer you want, uh, ported or sealed. So it's an incredible giveaway, full setup. We are really, really excited. Like you said, someone's going to go home or someone is going to be really, really lucky having a, a great system arrive at their door. I know one thing that's really cool, and maybe you guys can walk us through, uh, you guys have had a couple of really exciting product launches of late here in the last couple of months, and we've been really excited to partner with you guys on those. Why don't you guys uh, kind of walk us through what went into the thinking behind the new Pro 1000 series? Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll kick it off and Larry, I'll let you get into the specifics, but uh, obviously it's super exciting for us. We went about a year without um, having a product launch with, uh, you know, the pandemic and everything. It sort of slowed down some of the product development. But, uh, you know, as we've gotten into 2021, we've sort of come fast and furious here in the first couple of months. We've had two product launches with another one on the horizon. So we're really excited about that. And our, uh, our 1000 Pro series actually replaced one of our uh, most popular series of all time. And, and Larry, I'll let you sort of take it from there in terms of uh, what the technology is all about, what we're lo looking to accomplish with these new models. Yeah, so the the 1000 series that we had for years was my favorite sub in our lineup. Uh, it was a compact sub, 12 inch sub, you know, in a small cabinet, tons of output, uh, really unassumingly powerful whenever you'd see it. Like and, you, Larry, right? Yeah, you know, loud and obnoxious and can really go into any space, I guess. So I, I think that's why it was a kindred spirit for me. Um, but the, you know, it, it was getting a little long in the tooth and every other subwoofer in our lineup had been advanced to new amplification, more controls, a little bit different design. So the uh, 1000 Pro is kind of a complete evolution of the existing product. And something we've done in every model is now they all share a lot of technologies, but now we've gotten to where, where we start as a brand offers all the same feature sets as the model above. So it's uh, we went from a 300 watt amplifier to a 325 watt amplifier. It doesn't sound like a lot, but it, it made a difference. It's a brand new class D digital amplifier with an analog devices DSP, which is essentially the control system on the inside for recognizing the signal uh, and all MOSFET output. So it's got amazing control, clarity, speed, everything you're wanting from the amplifier to the driver, uh, completely redesigned 12 inch driver from the ground up on both the sealed and ported model. The previous ported model was uh, a 10 inch and it was unbelievable what it offered in a 10 inch, but now we've upgraded that to a 12. So they've both gotten a completely new redesign on the amplifier, the driver. They now both have our subwoofer control app, which we were the first brand to introduce that to the market about five years ago with our 16 ultra flagship piece. 
And I think where we made the biggest, most dramatic change was in the ported model because it went from just a single uh, port with that 10 inch driver to now a dual port design with the 12. So it's got more frequency capability, it can go lower. And now every model in our conventional subwoofer lineup from the 1000 Pro and above can hit that 20 Hertz no, uh, note that we're all really trying to hit. We only have one model in the lineup that can't do that now. And that's the new micro, which we'll probably get to here in a minute, but you can do it if you get the right room set up and everything too. Uh, but the ported model, the new PB1000 uh, floored me. Uh, I really did because it, it it's going to go up and compare to products that are two, three, four times the price. And in a lot of cases go lower, louder, deeper uh, with more capability. And if I can add on to that a little bit, I mean, one of the things we really tried to do with all of our most recent launches was bring the technology from our reference flagship 16 Ultras, which we designed about four or five years ago. Um, they really sort of set the world on fire. They won you know, all the awards that are available, got tons of great reviews. And so we took that amplifier platform and adapted it down to every subsequent subwoofer series that we've since launched. And that allowed us to really bring reference performance to lower and lower prices as we went along. And, you know, Larry mentioned the improvements we, we made to the PB1000 Pro, uh, but also, I mean, you, you had a dramatic step forward with the SB1000 Pro, specifically with the amplifier platform. You know, 25 watts may not seem a lot when you're looking at RMS power, but when you factor in the, the fully discrete MOSFET output, what that's allowing you to do is just send tons and tons of current into the driver, into the voice coil to be able to get just effortless output, be able to have just even you know quicker response than we were able to get with our original 1000 series, which were great subwoofers, but we would never call them reference subwoofers. I think the step forward that we took with both of these models, now with this amp amplifier platform, the uh, adjustments we made to the driver, um, all of those things sort of in coordination, it was a full rebirth of the ecosystem, I guess you could say, not just, you know, a new finish and maybe a, a you know, a slightly little, uh, you know, dialed up change here or there. It was a, a complete rebirth of the ecosystem. And I think the other important point to mention is that the price didn't go up for the sealed model. It did go up slightly for the yeah. ported model because we added the extra port. It's got a little extra cabinet volume. The driver's two inches larger. So there were significant uh, hardware upgrades with the ported model that uh, that made us need to increase the cost a bit, but the SB is the same exact price. Yet you're getting dramatically better import, uh, performance, which was really important for us when when progressing the line. Yeah, that's great. I had a chance to test them myself and was really really impressed. And I was really excited to see you know, or hear just exactly what you can get at that price point, which was really really impressive. So you know, kudos to you guys for a great product launch. And I kudos to you, Jonathan, because you did a great ported versus sealed video, and I thought you hit it out of the park with comparing the differences there. So I'm not just throwing shine on you. Like not many people can articulate that clearly, but it was a, it was a very well done comparison between the two models. Well, I appreciate that. A lot of, a lot of work went into it, obviously the whole team from, from audio advice. So, uh, but I do appreciate that a lot. I forgot to also introduce Nick Rich from uh, audio advice. He is on our sales team, does a tremendous job. Nick, thanks for- Hi, Nick. <laughs> Yeah, we, uh, we have two Nicks, so I guess it can get kind of confusing. So you just had a checkbox, said Nick, and eh, that works. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, let me introduce Nick. For those of you guys who join us on a monthly basis, Leon is enjoying some well-deserved time away in one of our national parks, and so Nick was happy to jump in. So uh, Nick, a couple of the same questions to you. First uh, concert you can't wait to go see post-COVID. Well, yeah, I was uh, the entire time. I was going to say Daft Punk, but you know, I don't think that's going to happen, uh, unfortunately. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to say the same thing uh, as before. Um, I think Orville Peck for those who are into uh, Americana. That's uh, a it's a great second choice. And the uh, the second thing that I'm uh, sipping on is uh, is a Burial IPA. This is their uh, Riding into the Heart of. Um, Heck, we'll say. Uh, really good Asheville beer. It's actually, since Leon's not here, it's uh, that's his favorite brewery as well. As well. So figured I uh, can uh, pay some honor to him. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And you're, you're uh, in, or gonna be heading out to that Asheville area here pretty soon. Yep. yep. Can I show um, Nick some love for his fashion sense too? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, this, uh, this right here, this is straight out of 1978. This is our original <laughs> audio advice logo. Yeah, if you want that T-shirt, it's uh, it's not available yet, but we'll be putting it on the website. Sure, I'm, I'm at some point here in the near future. But yeah, it's the uh, the original Audio Advice logo. We kind of went a little retro with that shirt, which is really cool. You guys started the same year I did, so. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm right there with you. I know exactly how long it was uh, when Leon started the company right out of college, basically. So, um, let's get to a couple of audience questions related to the Pro Series launch. So a lot of folks ask, you know, again, we cover it in our review, but maybe you guys can kind of give us the high, high level answer. David Smith uh, had a really good question. He's building a home theater and he's one of the rooms in his house. 
just wants to know what is the difference between a, uh, a ported and a sealed sub? Larry, you know you want this one. Yeah, so typically what you would uh, hear a lot of people say when you're talking sealed versus ported is a sealed sub will be faster, quicker to respond, uh, really more for music. And then somebody would also say a ported sub is really just for movies because it's loud and kind of boomy. And that's not the way we approach it. Um, if you have a preference in regards to where things can go and you have a size constraint, that's typically where we'll, we'll always recommend a sealed sub because they are smaller. But uh, we do love to say that every one of our sealed subs does everything well and nothing poorly. So they're great at music, movies, TV, gaming, daytime, nighttime watching. Uh, of the subs in my house, I only have one ported, the rest are sealed. Uh, but the reason I do have a ported subwoofer is it's down in my living room. And my living room is open concept and it opens to a kitchen and dining and a hallway and stuff. Um, and it can take on a larger space. So ported subs, if you're comparing really sealed versus ported, they will be louder. They can go deeper. But to a lot of people, the real benefit is that they can take on larger spaces. But if you can't fit a larger ported sub and can maybe do two smaller sealed subs, that's where a lot of people go to because duels will always assist with taking on more headroom. But something that's really cool with all of our ported models is they now all have the subwoofer control app. And you can reach out to our team and get what we call port plugs, where you can actually plug the ports on our subs to have them operate as a sealed sub. So the people that want the really tight, fast refinement of a sealed sub for some maybe some jazz or some fast guitar music uh, can have the benefit of a sealed sub. And if you want that intense IMAX theatrical bass, you can do a ported out of the exact same cabinet. So it's a really cool opera, uh, offering there. The only thing I'll add on to that is, um, you know, our engineers have tried really hard to narrow the delta in performance between a ported cabinet subwoofer and a sealed cabinet. You know, getting those ported models to react a little quicker, to have, you know, more crisp speed and transients and getting those uh, sealed models to dig a little bit deeper, give you a little bit more output. And, you know, I think it was a real, you know, landmark achievement to get that uh, the smallest sealed cabinet subwoofer we offer uh, besides the micro down to 20 Hertz, because before that wasn't possible. So, you know, allowing that to get to that infrasonic level of uh, low frequency extension, but then also getting the ported model to have the sealed mode. So it could be a little quicker, a little crisper with those uh, transients. Um, those are really important for us. And you'll see that across the SVS line, every single subwoofer series we offer has both a ported and a sealed model, because we understand that, you know, people have different tastes and we want to make sure that they have a, uh, you know, a lot of options to choose from when, uh, when you know, matching it with different speakers in different rooms. Yeah, crazy. Yeah, yeah. That a bit too. Yeah. Well, yeah, so one thing that I recommend, you know, people going with ported is if they don't have the budget, I love dual subs, so I typically recommend dual subs right off the, right off the gate, but, uh, you know, if they want to start out with a little bit lower budget, just going with a single ported subwoofer that they can upgrade down the road, add a second one, put both of them to sealed mode if they want that accuracy. So it's a good, you know, kind of middle ground for the, for the budget as well, but both Larry and Nick, you guys are spot on. Yeah, it's a great comment, Nick. You actually, uh, great little segue. So Skyler Long asked, is bigger better? Is bigger better? Or at what point would you choose to go with a dual sub? Who wants well, to start that's a tricky one. I mean, you know, we, we try not to, you know, make it all about room size or subwoofer size, but, you know, there's physics involved here. And the larger cabinet you have, the more output you're going to be able to create and the deeper low frequency extension you're going to get. And it's not just about cabinet size. Obviously, you need the amplifier to be matched to the driver. There's a whole ecosystem at play here. Um, so, you know, it's not as simple as, well, you get the biggest cabinet possible, you're going to get the deepest loudest bass that's not the you know it, you you might but it's going to might be boomy or it might sort of be distorted it's not necessarily going to be the cleanest most accurate bass that you're going to find so you know there's a lot of factors there that i think you should consider also the speakers you're matching it with the size of the room your listening preferences do you like it super loud do you you listen at more moderate levels um so i wouldn't simplify it down to the fact of well you know the bigger the subwoofer, for the better yeah. And a lot of it comes down to how you set it up to kind of piggybacking on that is uh, I, I think one of the most common things we run into with people setting up their subs is uh, inaccuracy when it comes to actually setting up their speakers. And I know I see some towers back there behind Nick and you know, a lot of people when they're setting up a system at home, 
will take a pair of towers regardless of brand or size or whatever. And the receiver, if you do your room correction, will typically set most towers as large speakers because it's recognizing a lot of frequency capabilities there. Well, if your receiver is set to large, you are actually taking away, I, I'm sorry, if your speakers are set to large on your receiver, you're actually giving your subwoofers less. You're taking away capability from your subwoofer. So I think also getting everything set right is very important too. Like I, every single speaker in our lineup, I set the small, no matter the receiver, unless I'm using separate amps uh, and let the subwoofers take on uh, more of the stage, more of the low frequency capabilities, because that's what they're there for. Yeah, and with, with two channel setups, it's it changes it even more because, you know, blending the subwoofer is super important for that. And, you know, I, I have a lot of trouble finding, I've, I've demoed a lot of subwoofers of these speakers and uh, I want to try the uh, uh, the 4000 series, really bad guy, so send me one. Uh, but <laughs> besides that, um, you know, it, it's about finding, matching the speed with your speakers is, is a huge piece, making sure it blends seamlessly. And Larry, like you're saying, you know, if you have a receiver, you can go in and set the crossover inside of the receiver. For a two-channel system, it's a little bit harder to do that. So, you know, people will go through and, you know, set crossover, low-pass frequencies, but an active crossover, you know, will help that a lot. But yeah, you guys spot on. Cool. Uh, next question is from... Mark Hawkins, when uh, related to using dual subs, he asked, if you want to use dual subs, can they be different SVS models? Larry? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes and no. So what we try to recommend, we, we will not recommend mixing a sealed and a ported. And I know I've seen that kind of come up here in the uh, the questions. Uh, when, you, when you mix a sealed versus ported, they end up canceling each other out in a lot of sense because you're going to get more volume and frequency typically from the ported model. Um, but if you are going to do duels, we, we do typically recommend that they are the same model. So if you're looking at like 1000 pros, do two SB 1000 pros or PB 1000 pros. Uh, or if you have maybe one of our older models, like an older 2000 series or a 13 ultra, find the product that matches with it the best so that there is a proper blend. But if you can't get exact, I know we've got people that bought, you know, a 4000 series and decide they want a second one but can't fit another 4,000. So they might go with a smaller model and you can absolutely make it work. It's just more that you need to do in regards to your setup, um, playing with your room correction a little bit more. You will be starting to play with phase, but if, if you can, we typically recommend doing two of the same model. Yep. Always sealed with sealed, always ported with ported. There's no compromises there. Just keep that the same. And then if you're going to go dual, either make them the same or keep them as close to the same amplifier power and driver size as possible. Cause you're just going to get better blending. It's going to be a more convincing experience. You won't have any of the, uh, you know, sort of mismatched or phase issues that, that Larry was talking about. So, I mean, if that's important to you, then, then certainly you'd want to get them as close, closely matched as possible. <laughs> Someone uh, said, poor Larry, Nick always hands off the technical questions. To him. Hey, no, it's cool. I'm the, the reason for that. Yeah. Hey, yeah. You got to know your strengths, right? Nick's, Nick yeah. is the VP of marketing, right? And, and Larry's the technical, the sales trainer. So I'll take the next one. Got to know your strengths for sure. <laughs> uh, all right. So next one, uh, this is in regard to buy amping. Should you buy amp your center channel? Does it really make that much of an impact? There you go, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Nick Larry, right? that's my answer. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I don't buy amp anything. Um, I just never have. Um, there's There are instances where it can make a difference, but um, really most people that we talk to typically don't. Um, you guys may have some different takes on that because I know you do two channel and uh, some other things, but I'm typically running off of AVRs and almost everything that I do because uh, most of my money goes to my kids. So uh, I don't get the big gear. AVRs, yeah, AVRs are a bit different too because you're coming up a one power supply. Yep. So, you know, if you're doing, it's really kind of like passive by amping or almost like bridging with a uh, with a standard amplifier. You're better off by wiring if you if you're using a receiver, uh, just because you can kind of bypass those jumpers and everything. But you know, if you uh, for your center channel, if you have a power hungry center channel and you have a good power amp that's going to be dedicating you know true watts to each uh, you know each binding post. Then yeah, it's 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 worth it. But otherwise, if you're using an AVR and you just happen to you know have a speaker that has dual binding posts, I I wouldn't worry about it. Maybe buy wire it. Yeah, good good answer. Uh, even I believe it's even asked the question. This is an interesting uh, topic as well. Uh, he wants to know a little bit more about how the whole 
crossover concept works. He said he's got a sub and two floor towers. How does how do you make that happen? Does it make sense to do so? Yeah, so I'll start this one, Larry, and then you're going to take it from me when uh, when I hand you the baton. But you know, ultimately, what we recommend is you know if you're using an AV receiver, run your uh, Odyssey or your room correction as you normally would. But when you're done, the one of the very first things you should look at is the subwoofer level and the crossover frequency. And, and Larry, why is that? So, well, kind of expound on that a little bit more. Um, when you are running your room correction, first thing you want to do, turn your subwoofer volume to about half uh, before you do anything. But uh, most new receivers now will have a volume adjustment when you start to recognize how loud your sub is. But after you've run all your room correction and stuff, um, we always go back and we check the crossover of our speakers first, uh, which normally sets them to large. And so you're taking away output to your subwoofer. So I change them to small and I find out a recommended crossover for the speakers. And it's normally about 20 to 30 hertz above where they bottom out. So like for instance, uh, I've got a pair of prime towers behind me, my thumbs here. This is a small 5.1.2 setup in here. And I'm just running a basic Onkyo receiver in here. Nothing special because it's just a game room for the kids and my junk. And uh, we've got it set up to where I ran the MCACC room correction. And I've got my towers crossed at 60 hertz. And my center channel uh, in the same ballpark and then surrounds and stuff. But my subwoofer I have crossed at 110. But my speakers are set at small. And the reason they're set at small, even though they're towers, is so that more of the energy is directed to the subwoofer and there's less wear and tear on your receiver at that point because it's not pushing as much out of the amplifier to the front stage. And it's uh, also going to open up your sound stage and your imaging quite a bit more too. And I, it's one thing that I think it, I would imagine is probably the most common call to our customer service line is my subwoofer doesn't sound like I think it should. And I would imagine out of about 80% of those cases, simply switching the crossover or your speakers from large to small so that more energy is directed to your sub takes care of a lot of that too. And I can, I can touch on this a little bit as well. Um, I'll be the two channel voice for now there but, you go. Uh, for two channel guys. If you have like an integrated amp or anything like that, you're not get, Most integrated amps don't have crossovers or if you have a two channel stereo receiver, a lot of those don't either. Uh, you know, if, unless you have an active crossover, which, cost quite a bit of money uh kind of what larry said setting it 10 percent or well about 10 uh hertz over your you know your, where your speakers bottom out is a safe place to put it because that'll help it transition and that's the low pass filter so a crossover and a low pass filter are a little different the crossovers you know where it starts sending signal to the sub and low pass filter is just saying hey i'll take it from here if, if that makes sense so your speakers will still go down to that gray area and it just won't be immediate cut Somewhat yeah. related to that, um, another thing that you uh, should always check after running room correction more so in a multi-channel setup is the distance. This has come up a bunch of times with us. A lot of times the uh, microphone will pick up the subwoofer and say it's 20 feet away when it's actually you know 10 feet away from the listening position. So making adjustments there can really dial in the sound that much more and making sure you're getting accurate uh, bass and, and convincing bass from what the director or the musician intended, um, because that is an area where it can overcompensate sometimes and say it's further away or say it's closer. Uh, so it is a good thing to check and, and align it with the actual distance. Um, but again, it's one of those things where you can just sort of test different options and uh, and see what the end result is and, and choose what works best. But that is another area where uh, the compensation can can sometimes be overkill. Yeah, great, great points. It looks like a lot of folks are, are getting a lot of value out of, out of this conversation. So that's great. Keep asking these questions. Uh, going back a little bit, <clears throat> Tony asked, he's looking at doing an Atmos 5.2.2 setup. What's your take on using ceiling mounted prime elevations versus bookshelves? Or maybe maybe standalone towers versus in ceiling or on wall? Uh, I, I mean, I would absolutely advocate for that. The uh, prime elevations, they have mounting hardware that makes it super easy to either put them high on a side wall so they're angled down the go. listening position or directly. Oh, there you go. See, Larry's uh, showing the real uh, real world application there. Yeah, that, I love the side wall. Wall. Yeah. You know, when you have a ceiling fan, you probably wouldn't want to put them directly on the ceiling because you get a little bit of, uh, you know, distortion there with, with the fan moving around. Um, but absolutely, you know, as long as you have at least half of the bracket mounted into a stud, you know, you'll be safe up there. We have these little uh, ceiling lock mounts that go in there, so they'll never uh, jiggle free from, you know, from the mounting hardware. Um, but to me, that is 
you know, as far as the uh, execution, you get almost a full range speaker mounted to your ceiling and it's tough to find an in ceiling that can do that. Certainly the ceiling toppers, they limit the frequency. I'm sorry, the uh, towers, you know, the toppers that you put on those that bounce it off the ceiling, their frequency response limited. So you're not even going to get a full range speaker there. Um, so I absolutely think it's one of the best ways to use the elevation for Dolby Atmos, DTSX, Hydus Fax, those, those kind of things. Yeah. And I think where the, the elevation really comes into play, those are the ones I just showed on the sides of my room here. Uh, if you go to a movie theater and you look at, you know, when we can all get back to movie theaters, think about how the speakers are designed. They're on the side walls or on the ceilings, and they're always aimed towards the listening position. They're not just shooting straight down like a ceiling speaker, and there's no reflective toppers or anything like that. And we know not everybody can get up and install stuff on their walls or ceilings, uh, especially if you think about cutting holes for an in-ceiling or in-wall speaker. You can't do that in an apartment. You know, in an apartment, you can absolutely hang stuff on a wall, and that's kind of where the elevation comes into play. Because you know, when you live in an apartment, you know you find creative ways to cover up the holes when you leave. So you can do that: toothpaste, a little plaster, whatever. But the elevation is a great solution because it's such a quick and easy install. I've got the mount right here, and the way the speaker is designed, it goes on the wall and it's kind of angled towards your listening position, just like a theatrical speaker. And if you've got wire, you can get up. I hid wire behind curtains. I don't hide wire in here. I'm lazy. Um, but you have the mount that goes on the wall. Like Nick was saying, two of these screws would go into a stud and the other two can just go on the wall. And then you've got this keyhole right here. And the keyhole is this piece that goes on and it's hard. I'm wearing black. Sorry. Uh, you can see these pegs that are here and that goes on the back of the speaker. And you simply just have this mount on the wall, hang the speaker in there and it's done. But if it's going to go on your ceiling because it is a keyhole, we want to be safe. It includes this lock that just slides right over it and prevents the speaker from moving as you're cranking it. And the elevation can mix with so many brands because it's a very neutral speaker. And I, I prefer uh, middle height. Um, some people like mid, uh, front, rear, whatever. I just think middle is cool because it creates that full 360 degree bubble. Yeah. And the only thing I'll throw in is it, we, we sort of launched it thinking it would be like a niche product, like something that, you know, yeah, maybe some people will adopt. But like Larry said, because it's so neutral and so accurate, it's become our most popular speaker because it is being implemented with a lot of different brands of uh, multi-channel home theater setups, you know. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to rattle off brands, but we, we have people calling every day. And, you know, I'm sure you guys have as well. Uh, will this match with B&W? Will this match with Cliff Willis? And, you know, there's not a lot of other solutions that deliver what it does with the mounting hardware, et cetera. So um, it's really been sort of a surprise for us, but a, a very pleasant one. Yeah. And, you know, if if you have to mix brands of, you know, standard speakers with tweeters, you know, with timber matching and everything, an Atmos or a height speaker is a good speaker to do that with because it doesn't carry a ton of detail. And so, you know, that's that's the best one to do it with. And, you know, in ceiling versus elevation, I would take a look at your room, reach out to us if you're thinking about doing it as well, because there are certain degrees that work inside of Atmos' specs. So if your room's super wide, you know, maybe putting the outside might not work. Or if you're doing a DIY, it's really tough to run it. Let's say you had a two-story house, you're doing the first floor. DIY in-ceiling speakers can be kind of kind of challenging. So you know, just feel free to reach out to us as well. Yeah, absolutely. Just real quick to kind of to uh, maybe piggyback on that a little bit. We have an incredible home theater design tool that we've uh, calculated exactly to those specs that that Nick mentioned. So you can go in and you can plug in your room dimensions. You know, the uh, the amount of seating that you want, the number of rows, you know, risers. Um, the, the optimal viewing position, all of these things we calculate for you where the ideal or, or exact uh, speaker placement should go. And we can walk you through, you know, from, from room design all the way to installation and to, you know, performance optimization and so forth. So reach out to us. We can schedule a one-on-one -on -one dedicated appointment uh, at audioadvice.com. We love, love walking folks through uh, building these dream home theaters. And you can also check out our YouTube channel where we give a lot of examples of some of the home theater installs that we do. So if you haven't already subscribed to our YouTube channel, please go ahead and do so as well. Uh, it's a great way for us to sort of showcase not only the products like uh, we launched with partners like SBS, but a lot of the install jobs that we do with some really cool home theater designs and house showcases, which are, which are really cool. So another audience question, this one is from Jeff. We're talking obviously about, you know, large subwoofers that, that uh, deliver a big sound. He says, is there a rule of thumb for how big your sub I'm sorry, actually wrong question. <laughs> yeah, with isolation, will isolation feet help the shaking walls and my wife? I have my sub on my carpet now. Tell us maybe a little bit of your thoughts on, uh, on isolation and maybe you know how to uh, keep your significant other from uh, making you turn it down when you're in the middle of that really cool scene on your favorite movie. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, ultimately what the isolation system is doing is uh, what's called decoupling the subwoofer from the room. So when you have the standard feet, uh, a lot of times some of the resonance or the vibrations from just the sheer amount of uh, force and energy being created by that driver motion is being transferred into the into the floor, in, in which then sort of carries up through the walls. So you get the rattling knickknacks, you get the windows, you, anything that's loose in your room, uh, light fixtures, etc. You'll you'll know that they're loose. And you know, some people have this sort of morbid curiosity. They love that. They're like, oh, I know it's working when I hear my whole rattling. And, and I actually think it's a little bit distracting. I'd rather you know get a cleaner base experience. Um, so you know, the two things that the uh, isolation system will really accomplish is one decouple it from the room so you get cleaner, tighter base with all those distractions. And then secondarily, it'll make you a better neighbor. So whether it's a roommate, whether it's somebody next door, whether it's your wife trying to sleep, you know, it just reduces a lot of that uh, resonance and some of those uh, shaking uh, that you get throughout the house from, you know, those sort of big bass drops or those explosive action movie scenes. And, uh, and that's important for a lot of people because, you know, you, you want to be a good neighbor. You want to, you know, take care of your family without keeping them awake all night, but you also want to crank it. So we've actually heard people that are able to turn up the gain, turn up the volume on the subwoofer and have less of that, uh, you know, sort of shaking effect and the rattling effect uh by installing the uh the feet on the subwoofer yeah i can uh i want to touch yeah, on that. Hand, okay. cool. oh yeah there you go Those things are awesome that? and the other thing i'll throw out is they fit with not just svs subwoofers they have uh multiple thread sizes so you can add them to uh almost any brand of subwoofer and even if the thread sizes don't fit we uh provide these double-sided uh basically tape or foam pads that allow you to stick to stick it to the bottom of the subwoofer and uh they are not just for subwoofers are they larry no, man, I've used them for all kinds of stuff. Uh, if you're a two-channel purist, you probably have a turntable in the mix. And so you can take those little teeny tiny uh, feet off of a turntable and use this for more vibration uh, reduction. I've used them in my component stand downstairs. It's I've got a funky setup. It's awful. Uh, so my components are inside a TV stand. And for better airflow, I use these there too. You can use them under tower speakers, replace you know, bookshelf uh, stand feet, all kinds of stuff. Uh, but they're a really great solution. At 50 bucks, it's cheaper than most other uh, options out there for isolation and will typically work better than a pad because it's not really doing, that tends to do dampening as well. So by just simply decoupling it, you do uh, tend to get a better output from it too. Yeah, one thing with decoupling is that you know you think about like wooden floors. It acts a lot, wood is very resonant, and so you think about it like an acoustic guitar. You know, it's it's really amplifying you know, amplifying the strings, bringing out a lot of the sound. And so, whenever you add the isolation feet to a subwoofer to a floor standing speaker, it's going to change your frequency response inside the room. So just how your room reacts with it, and it'll make a it'll make a huge difference. Uh, also, it'll keep the neighbors happy. But you guys put a lot of R and D into those isolation feet. So a, a lot of people look at it and say, "Oh, it's rubber. I could just use a tennis ball or some erasers. It's going to do the same thing." But yeah, you guys put a ton of work. I mean, whenever you guys first showed us those, I was I was really impressed by it. Yeah, I don't want to overplay that part, but we went through. It's called Duralastomer. It's like kind of like rubber, but we went through like fifty different versions of like different compounds till we got to the one that actually measured. Uh, to reduce the amount of resonance it was creating the most. So um, it took a lot longer than I think we expected to develop that product. And they look so simple, but uh, it was important. You know, if we're going to launch something like that, it's got to work. So, uh, you know, we, we went to the extra mile to make sure we got the best material. And uh, it's been, you know, now one of our most popular accessories that we sell. Absolutely. Yeah, I can't recommend them enough. Uh, they work great on carpet. They work great on hardwood floors as well, if that's the type of setup that you have at home. So Definitely a great way to to help optimize your, your performance that you get out of your subwoofers. Um, someone did ask earlier, when are you guys launching a uh, spouse negotiation department? I'm assuming they're uh, referring to the fact that <laughs> you got to keep those neighbors and, and significant others happy uh, when you're when you're watching your favorite movie. Uh, James asked a really good good question, maybe a great segue question for us. He said, "What would be a great sub that would complement a small bookshelf speaker?" And so I know you guys had another product launch that maybe you guys can. Uh, Tell us more about. Sure. Well, I would certainly recommend the SB1000 Pro, the sealed cabinet version of what uh, Larry just described. But um, our most recent product launch that we did was actually a, a new category for SVS, which is shocking. Other than like a 36 inch driver subwoofer that uh, is probably our most requested. When are you guys going to make a subwoofer that's bigger than my car? Uh, the second most was when are you going to make a micro subwoofer? So we finally uh, got around to it. And, uh, you know, really what made it possible was the amplifier platform that we sort of dove into earlier. 
you know, when we decided to embark upon a, uh, a super small subwoofer, we wanted to make sure that it would deliver a legitimate uh, subwoofer experience worthy of the name SVS, I guess you could say, um, which we do say a lot. And, uh, you know, what we ended up with was this dual eight inch driver subwoofer that's roughly 10 inches on all sides. So super compact, much smaller than anything that we've developed in the past. Um, and, you know, we, we basically outfitted it with our 3000 series amplifier platform, which is uh, 800 watts RMS, 2,500 watts peak power. So you're getting a ton of output. Um, and I think to, to sort of understand the challenges of a, a micro subwoofer, designing one that's actually fit to, to deliver real performance, you kind of have to look at the history of micro subwoofers. And a lot of designs in the past have relied on this passive radiator technology, which uh, our director of technology, Ed Mullen, has a cute name for them called drone cones. So basically when you have a passive radiator, you have one active driver, and then you have one dummy driver on the side, which is basically reacting to it. It's not actually powered. There's no voice coil. There's no actual power going to it. It's just sort of reacting with the, uh, you know, the, the output of the other active driver. So what we did was a dual active eight inch driver with uh, fully, uh, fully discrete MOSFET output and uh, they're wired in parallel. So mechanically and acoustically in parallel, they're basically moving in and out at the same exact time which really allows you to, to pressurize a room and almost have like a dual subwoofer effect. I won't say that it's like having dual subwoofers, but when you have two drivers moving in unison and they're both active, they're both powered, then you get much greater output. And I think the other issue with those drone cones is that one, the uh, passive radiator is a little slower. So you'll notice that there'll be some distortion, some boominess, it won't quite keep up with the active driver. And then the other sort of uh, anecdotal story that I think a lot of people who have owned micro subwoofers in the past, is they have a tendency to dance. They kind of walk across the room because they're sort of a little off uh, kilter when, when they're at full excursion. So you'll see it sort of dancing across your room and you're like, whoa, where's it going? Um, you know, with this subwoofer, even when it's at max excursion, like really hitting hard during a bass drop or whatever, you put your hand on it, it's like it's doing nothing. Like you don't feel it, but you just sort of feel it in the room. So I think that was uh, another big sort of landmark innovation that we, we put into this subwoofer was making sure the cabinet was sonically inert. It wasn't moving on, um, you know, dancing across the room. And you were able to get a, a, a true reference subwoofer experience from a, a super compact cabinet. And Larry, what did I miss? I, I think what it really is, is when you look at the micro category as well, they've always been about mid bass and just kind of being loud. So you know they're there. And that's not what we were going for here. We wanted to make a product that to told all those same stories that the uh, other products above it did and before it. So now I've got it here under my desk. I've got my existing SB1000 sitting over here on the couch because I replaced the 1000 with the micro. And it, it's been insane. I think Nick's about to grab it for a, a, a little show and tell here. But yeah, I mean, it's compact. It's under an 11 inch cube. It's, I, I saw somebody mention it was sexy. And, you know, for a subwoofer, you can't really say that because they're normally just big boxes. But this thing is designed really, really well. And I let out some expletives whenever I first started it because I just I just went out and cranked it immediately. I've got a pair of our prime wireless bookshelves here on my desk and uh, have that connected up there for a 2.1. And I noticed that I had knocked down another album because I've been working on PowerPoint and getting really loud this last week. And uh, I always appreciate that. But it's so clean. It's it's. And I had another store call me a couple of days ago, like, I, I can't feel it. And that was really awesome. They were touching it. It doesn't even feel like it's doing anything, but you can feel it uh, throughout the room. And Larry, doesn't, doesn't it have to do with not only the cabinet design, but having the woofers back to back, they essentially just cancel each other out, kind of like how noise canceling headphones work. It's like a single sine wave and then an opposite polarity sine wave. It just makes it dead. So yeah, you're not going to have any dancing just oh, also because you guys have a killer cabinet, but also it's just the science behind it. Yeah, there was a lot that went into it from the driver design being wired in parallel across from each other. If you look at it, Nick had it up there, but the amp is actually kind of at an angle. It's part of on the back and the bottom of the actual unit. So by folding the amp, it's actually a really cool design. It does more for heat dispersion on the inside. Uh, this thing does not get hot. Uh, I've been really, I, and I put it through its paces too. Uh, if you guys watch our stuff, you know, I get kind of stupid. And uh, that one, I, I really just, I started off kind of mild and then went into uh, the Weekends album and just went nuts. And I actually knocked down a 1983 Star Wars lunch box and, box and dented it. And I was not very happy, but it, it made me laugh. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of folks are asking about a wireless setup. So it's actually an interesting question. We sell a, lot, a ton of the wireless adapters. What are your thoughts on 
both, I guess, wireless uh, speakers and wireless subs? You know, how much are you losing uh, when you go that route, if any? So I'll start with subwoofers. Every one of our current models now has a USB output on the back, which allows you to power the wireless adapter that you just referenced. Um, so it makes it much easier to not have to have that extra outlet to power the adapter. Um, you know, it, I won't sit here and say it's completely the same as running a wired connection, but I would say for 99% of the people, it's unnoticeable. So you're, you're just not gonna be able to notice whatever minimal latency there is with having that wireless adapter installed. And when you talk about, you know, the benefits of, you know, having more placement options or reducing cable clutter, I think a lot of people are willing to make whatever perceived sacrifice there might be with latency in order to achieve that cleaner setup to have the optimal placement that you get from being able to use a wireless setup. Um, so that that's where I would say, you know, the subwoofers come into play as far as wireless. And, and Larry, I'll, I'll let you talk to speakers and, and add anything else onto that that you'd like. It, in regards to also something you got to keep in mind with wireless. So our wireless transmitter has a less than a quarter of a uh, millisecond delay. So it, it's really second microsecond, whatever, sorry, microsecond. So let's measure that. Uh, but uh, <laughs> um, so you're not going to notice it. The one time that it can get tricky with wireless subs is if you're doing multiples, because you would not want to have one that's wired and one that's wireless. You would want to have them both be the same. Uh, so we do, uh, our wireless kit can do multiples. And I, there's other ones that are out there that are can. Um, but in regards to wireless speakers, I saw the questions come up a few times. You know, there's wireless surround speaker options, and that's like a kit you add on, and it's normally an amplifier you have to plug speakers to, and they're not very much power. You know, it's more of a convenience thing. It's never going to be a performance and sound thing. So they might be 20 watts to each of your speakers. So at that point, I just probably wouldn't do it. But when you're talking wireless speakers, which I think is where a lot of things have shifted over the last couple of years, there is a big difference because most of us will be familiar with the, the multi-room audio solutions that are out there, like the Sonos, the Heos, the Music Cast, the, the Amazon devices, all those things where you're putting music all over your house. And it's amazing because now everyone in your home can listen to stuff. Uh, we introduced uh, two wireless products uh, just about two years ago now. Uh, they're a little different take on multi-room audio or wireless products. And that we introduced a what's called prime wireless they're a powered speaker pair so it's a 200 watt stereo powered pair that you don't even have to put on your network if you don't want to but it's a great two channel solution you know, it's 100 watts per channel uh you've got an optical input to hook up to a television or a cd player a gaming system analog inputs to hook up to older legacy equipment bluetooth if you just want to stream off your uh, phone directly uh, but if you do throw it on your network you gain the ability to do 24, 192, so high res streaming like FLAC files or high res stuff from like Tidal and Kobas and Amazon Music HD. Uh, you have the ability to do multi-room audio if you get it on your network. So you can put uh, like, a, I've got a pair here on my desk. I've got the amplifier here that's a separate piece. And then uh, three other rooms in the house have speakers. And instead of just being the little Amazon dots, which we also use for voice control, they don't sound great, the little dots and stuff, but when I throw a two channel solution in a room, it's amazing. And it's become, instead of just being background music, it's actually something that we can all listen to and enjoy. And being a family of five, we all have different listening habits. So each of my kids have presets they listen to. My wife has presets we listen to. And what I mean by that is uh, it uses an app called DTS PlayFi on your phone or tablet. And you can then open your Pandora or Spotify or Tidal or whatever and start a stream and then physically save your favorite streams as a preset on the front of the speaker or the amplifier that we have and never have to touch an app again, just like your car radio, you just start it up. And if you get a power, and I think this is kind of a roundabout way to get to the answer if they sound good or not, uh, giving them a ton of power, the first thing and first and foremost was they had to sound good. And then, oh, by the way, it can go on your network and do all these other things. And so if you get the right wireless solution, absolutely. And there's some great ones out there now too, but there's still a lot that are more about the look than they are the sound. Yeah, and you know, Bluetooth initially gave wireless a super bad rap because it was a low transfer rate. And Wi-Fi has a much higher potential and you know, there's a lot of really good formats out there. PlayFi is a big one. Uh, Chromecast Audio, which is on a lot of different devices, is capable of doing, I think, 2490, I don't think it's 192 yet. 
but it's getting there. I mean, AirPlay can still go up to CD quality. So there's a lot out there that do a, you know, a killer job. I stream a lot over Wi-Fi to you know, my stream or my two-channel system. You know, I use vinyl as well. But yeah, it's uh, wireless is definitely a good option. It's grown a lot. And I think it's you know, with the advancements in internet and everything, I think it's going to get even larger. I mean, just look at Cobuzz. They're, they're doing some really great stuff. Uh, you know, 24192. So yeah, I would definitely recommend wireless if you haven't jumped into it yet. Awesome. Yeah, time's flying. Uh, thanks for all the, the insight there. That's great. Brian said he's uh, one and a half rum and cokes in. These aren't good for his, his liver. Hey, we can't help your health, but we, we're glad you're having a good time. We're glad everyone's enjoying this. So we got a couple more minutes. The the hour is flying by. So maybe uh, backing up just a little bit, we get a lot of questions uh, on demos, both for home theater and for audio. And if you've ever been to a show like Rocky Mountain or Expono, or maybe you've been to CES, uh, that's one of my highlights is going to see SBS and uh, seeing the demos that they do because they really, really do a great job. So, Larry, I'll start with you. Uh, I know you have a list, maybe your top top five home theater demo tracks that you can share with everyone. Well, I, I think I'm going to change up and not necessarily five, but maybe five that don't get talked about a lot. And I, let's see, I grabbed six movies here. Which one am I going to take out? I'll take out Spider-Man because I've talked about it a bunch. But I grabbed five here that were all about video and audio because I know you guys do both. And a lot of us are into that. So, you know, I grabbed Venom off my shelf here. And if you haven't seen this, it's big, stupid, dumb fun. And that's really all I want from a movie uh, when I sit down and go to a theater. But, you know, I thought Tom Hardy was really great at it. But it's got a couple sequences that not only look amazing, but sound great, too. There's a sequence where he's on a motorcycle being chased by a couple guys in SUVs. And there's there's gunfire and there's uh, drones and all kinds of stuff. And you get a ton of experience all around you in regards to your surround, but some phenomenal low end too. Anything Christopher Nolan does, Tenet, uh, phenomenal soundtrack, only 5.1, but man, the musical score on this will drive your subwoofer for home. Alita Battle Angel, maybe the best experience I've ever had in a movie theater because I got to see it in a Dolby Cinema Theater with Dolby Atmos, Dolby Vision 3D, which is super cool. Uh, but there are some sequences in here uh, right in the middle. They uh, play this game uh, like Murder Ball where they're all skating around, chasing each other down. There's crowd, there's collisions, there's explosions, all kinds of stuff going on there. Uh, Ad Astra, uh, we do this one at a lot of our shows. Chapter 2, very beginning, uh, where the actual space station explodes, not giving away anything there. But a super low frequency bass note goes well under the 20 hertz scale. And then to change it up completely, The Star is Born. Uh, if you have not seen that one, um, that's the only movie I can remember in years where I didn't touch my popcorn or drink when I saw it in the theaters. But uh, it has got uh, a special section. Same thing with like the Queen uh, Bohemian Rhapsody movie and uh, the Elton John movie Rocket Man. There's a special section on the disc where you can go right to the music. Oh, and cool. the music mix on there is amazing. And when they do Shallow... Uh, it's unreal because it, it's mixed from like behind the stage and then comes forward and then changes. So it's great for subs, height effects, front, surround stage, all the way around. So I don't think we've ever talked about that one on our. Uh, no, we haven't, Larry. But usually Larry introduces uh, his favorite of all time, which uh, really tends to irk our uh, CEO, and that's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So since he wouldn't mention it, I felt like I had to. There's a uh, scene in uh, where they're rolling down a hill in the snow and. It's very aggressive. It, it, it has uh, it, it either clears people out of the room or gets people into the room, one or the other. There's there's hardly uh, any in between there because it's so aggressive. And the one that I will throw in there, I did see Greatest Showman. That's a great track for a lot of reasons. Uh, but my my one suggestion is uh, the opening scene to Baby Driver. I love it because there's uh, the the reason I love it is because uh, I can set it up as a demo for transient response of a subwoofer, which I feel is a very underrated quality. That ability to be crisp in terms of the uh, you know articulation of various bass notes and they have all sorts of crazy like stomping on the brakes shifting the uh, gear and it's uh it's just a really cool experience for a, a subwoofer but all also you know just surround effects and a, a badass car scene too so it, it's fun yeah and i see people asking about concerts if you do not own Hans zimmer live in prague uh i assure you that is the most listened to thing that i play period my kids have never watched it but they all know the music to it. And it's funny, I catch uh, Ethan, he's my 12 year old, humming a lot. And it's always something from the Hans Zimmer disc and he's never ever sat in front of it. It's just how often it's pumping from my uh, room in here when I'm working. Uh, 
Awesome, great list. Lots of great suggestions in the in the comments as well, which is really really cool to see. Nick is a, a bit of an old soul, a big two channel guy. You had a couple of great audio uh, demos yeah. mentioned as well. Yeah, for so for two channel, that's my big thing. I, I love demo tracks. So funny enough, if you guys can see this sign, whichever side of me, um, <laughs> on Wayne's World, there's a there's a sign in the music shop that says "No Stairway to Heaven" because it's the most overplayed song in uh, in <laughs> guitar shop. So mine says "No Hel Hotel California." Because it's the most overplayed in uh, <laughs> in hi-fi shops, but I do, you know, I enjoy the song nonetheless. But I can vouch uh, for that. That is true, one hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. If yeah, anybody's and, and in Nora Jones, Jones yeah. yeah, yeah, Nora Jones, Diana Krall, great stuff. But yeah, if you work in there, you get a little tired of it. But um, so I, I wanted to pick out some songs that really, you know, test bass, and I, I kind of did the exact same thing as Larry. I tried to find some, even though you guys have a very good comprehensive article on demo tracks. I tried to pick some that were around that. I still overlap without even looking at yours. But um, yeah, so one that I really recommend is uh, Hideaway by Jacob Collier. Uh, great artist. It's got a deep bass intro. It really helps set up the soundstage. Uh, just sounds fantastic. One that really helps test uh, the extension of your speakers, accuracy, live performance is uh, So What by Miles Davis. A great soundtrack. Another hi-fi classic, but uh, still a good one nonetheless. Uh, SVS, this is one I know you guys use. Uh, Limit to Your Love by uh, James Blake. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. uh, I get it's done with a standard that really for uh, for you know testing subwoofers. If you guys have a sub at home, you want to test it out, play it. Yeah, it's 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 amazing, and it will also yeah. test. You know, it, it tests your subwoofer, but it also tests uh, or tests the structural integrity of your house. So <laughs> if you have uh, if you have picture frames, you know, make sure they're on there well. Uh, one that's not quite as popular, it's a newer one, it's a uh, Dragon Ball Do-Rag by Thundercat. Thundercat's a really great bass player. So uh, if you guys want to check that one out, really cool uh, uh, bass line in that. Um, the other one is Can't Leave the Night by Bad Bad Not Good. Uh, really good bass line in that. So an honorable mention. I know I didn't do any classic rock, which, uh, you know, People don't like. Uh, I would probably say. Um, Dan's always one that we see at the shows. Here oh, yeah. <laughs> Check out Badge by uh, Cream. Uh, really cool baseline in that. Uh, so Cream, Clapton, you know, good stuff. Nick, can I share a quick little story? The uh, I know you mentioned Jacob, Jacob Collier. Uh, his one of his sound engineer actually owns dual SB16 Ultras. So there's a good chance that that track was actually mixed and mastered using our subwoofers. I know we don't specifically sell pro audio, but uh, he, he's got a home studio. He put these yeah. subwoofers in and he now masters a lot of the tracks for Jacob, who's a brilliant musical artist, by the way. Uh, I couldn't recommend listening to him. He's just a lot of great stuff he's producing now. So, Oh, yeah. That um, track's one of my favorites for really every piece of audio. Bass, yeah, I, I love aging all of it. Yeah, awesome suggestions. We'll post, uh, well, one, we'll post a list of everything that we just mentioned in the comments so that you guys, if you go back and watch, we uh, will have that listed here for you. And and we'll also, I know there are a lot of questions that we weren't able to get to. Obviously, we were trying to keep to exactly one hour. Uh, we will be going back in the next day or so and answering as many of those questions that we can in the comments. So feel free to go back, rewatch it, uh, looking for your question. And again, we'll try to answer as many of those as we can uh, that we weren't able to get to in this last hour. It is kind of funny. Brian uh, Becker says, thanks for doing these happy hours. He's the one that mentioned a comment about it. he's already a couple of uh, rum and cokes in. And his wife said in the comments, now I know what you're doing at home. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll yep. out here to have a little bit of fun. So I appreciate everybody uh, uh, with the comments and the conversation and, and keeping this a lot of very light, a lot of fun, hopefully very informative, hopefully very educational as well. So Nick, uh, Nick Brown from SBS, thanks so much for joining us, Larry, as always. And Nick Rich, thanks for uh, for filling in, doing a great job, like you always do. Really appreciate it. Um, the winner for our best question, so the Prime Wireless setup that's a six hundred dollar value. The winner for that is, question is Larry Teal, who is the one who asked about the wireless setup and uh, how much accuracy is lost. So, awesome. yeah, congrats, Larry. Questions hard hard to pick a winner, obviously, but the winner for best question goes to uh, Larry Teal. And then I'll put back up one more time the. Uh, the full package that we are giving away, the 5.1 home theater giveaway. Again, $2,300 package. There or about going to make someone here really, really happy. Um, the winner, drum roll please, the winner for our 5.1 home theater giveaway brought to you by SVS, our good friends, is Joseph Roybal. Hopefully I said that correctly. Joseph out of Texas. We'll be reaching out to you to uh, give you this brand new setup. Congratulations. 
I know that was a heck of a lot of fun. Um, as always, guys, thank you so much for joining us. I will go ahead and announce the, our next month's giveaway, which we're really excited about. Let me pull that up uh, from our friends at both uh, Canto and at uh, U-Turn, which is a, a great turntable company out of the uh, New England area and, and our friends at Canto. So great powered speaker and turntable package. Really popular as always. Uh, almost $1,700 value. So go ahead and uh, enter now. The link is already there. And obviously, don't forget, if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you will also get an extra entry. So please feel free to do so as well. Uh, gentlemen, let me go back to our comments here. Thanks again for joining us. Again, thanks to everyone from tuning in all over the world, all over the country. This has been a lot of fun. We love doing these. It's great to sort of interact with everyone uh, the best that we can in this, in this COVID world. We're excited to hopefully get back on the road here real soon. But thanks again for joining us, and uh, we will see you again next time. Thanks, guys. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Happy listening.